Uh, we're going to go ahead now and move into our first panel, Return of the Chinook, a look at uh, the return of those fish to our river. Uh, our first speaker is Bart Vaughn. Um, Bart served 30 years as an officer in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Four of those years were involved in the salmon restoration program on the Columbia River, where he worked closely with Native Americans, the Bureau of Reclamation, and National Marine Fishery Service. Subsequently, Bart served as the Caltrans District 6 Director and the CAO for Fresno County. In retirement, he has worked as a consultant for the California High Speed Rail Project and is a former president of the board for the San Joaquin River Parkway and Conservation Trust. He's going to be provide, providing a brief history of the San Joaquin River. Uh, so welcome, Bart, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Josh and Don. Uh, it's uh, a real pleasure to be able to share this very brief history of the San Joaquin River with you today. I intend to start by describing the San Joaquin River system in its natural state, go on to talk about the modifications that have been applied, and then look at the operation of the river leading up to the beginning of restoration. So we're going to start with the title slide, and I was looking for slides that would show us the natural condition of the river system, and I came up with these two. The photo on the left shows uh, runoff off the snow in the high Sierras above the highest dams at the headwaters of the San Joaquin River. Now, you've got to get to 8,000 feet in the Sierras to be able to see this natural condition. The uh, photo on the right uh, would, I think, approximate what um, the river system would look like in the San Joaquin in the valley at the end of the fall at high, a lower, low flow period uh, with an intact riparian system. Uh, this photo comes uh, from an area about halfway between Friant Dam and the city of Fresno near Ball Ranch. I'm sure you, uh, most of you know where that is. So moving ahead, we're going to look at the natural system. So this slide is a, um, a graphic example of what the natural system looked like. On this slide, north is to the left, and you see the San Joaquin Sacramento Delta on the left side of the slide. The Sierra Nevada Mountains are on the top of the slide, and the coast range is at the bottom the southern end of the San Joaquin Valley is to your right. Um, in the natural state, typical flows in the San Joaquin River and its tributaries would have reflected the hot, dry summers, uh, relatively little rainfall in this uh, valley, uh, about 12 inches these days around Fresno uh, per year, uh, and a snowpack that would build through the winter and then uh, as it warmed up in the spring would start to uh, melt and then cause flood flows in the spring. Now, based on the individual weather conditions in the spring, that flood flow could be early or could be late. Uh, in any case, the flood flows would deliver water to the riparian forests, to the wetlands, uh, and would recharge the groundwater. And in this situation, the river flows support the fish, fish passage that was discussed earlier by Don. The first uh, human occupation in this area occurred about 10,000 years ago. Uh, Native Americans moved into the valley. They uh, lived along the banks of the rivers and around the shores of the lakes. Uh, they had to live close to the water to be able to access drinking water, water for cooking, and water for washing. Uh, they hunted and fished in the uh, thick, uh, rich uh, riparian corridors that went along every uh, river, the San Joaquin, all the tributaries, and the major streams. So I'm going to go ahead and start and uh, discuss um, the operation of this system. I think it's very safe to say that over this 10,000 years, the impact the Native Americans had on this system was minimal. This is almost the ideal situation uh, of the application of riparian rights where everyone in the system was able to use the river 
but not impair the use by others. So starting down at the uh, south end of the valley to your right, uh, we have the Kern River coming out of the Southern Sierras, flowing across the valley and filling a Buena Vista Lake, then flowing north through Goose Lake into the Tulare Lake Basin. Uh, Tulare Lake uh, was originally uh, the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi uh, in terms of area. Not very deep, but uh, very large and lots of uh, wetlands all around it, which provided uh, uh, good, great habitat and areas for the Native Americans to live. Several rivers and streams flow into the Tulare Lake Basin, the Tule River, the Cahuilla, and, and primarily the Kings River. When the uh, lake was full, the water would flow north from uh, the Tulare Lake Basin, connecting up to the uh, Fresno Slough and into the San Joaquin River. Note that the San Joaquin River starts in the Sierras and flows down into the valley uh, and meets the Kings River uh, about halfway down the San Joaquin Valley. It continues north and picks up the flows from all the other tributaries uh, all the way to the Delta. And of course, in those days, uh, the Delta, uh, certainly during flood uh, times, uh, was an entire uh, area uh, that was a wetlands. Again, rich riparian forest and wetlands all along all of these uh, tributaries and along the main channel of the San Joaquin. Um, the first outsider to come in and view this scene and explore the San Joaquin River and document it, San Joaquin, entire San Joaquin uh, Valley, was Gabriel Moraga in 1806. So that was over a uh, little over 200 years ago, not, not that long ago. He saw the rich riparian uh, corridors. Uh, he saw the wildlife and the plains. Uh, he saw um, millions of waterfowl, uh, and he encountered the Native Americans. Now, in the early 1800s, there was very limited settlement uh, in this area. A few people had acquired Spanish or later Mexican land grants, and they moved into the valley to, to raise wheat and, uh, and uh, uh, handle uh, the growth of, of livestock and produce uh, some food. Um, so this was a situation up to the middle of the 1800s. All changed, all of this changed in 1848 with the discovery of gold. Thousands of people started flooding into California, coming by land, coming by sea. Most of them headed for the central Sierras uh, to mine for gold. And they caused tremendous impact on the environment in the central Sierras. It is still evident today with eroded hills, uh, diverted uh, surface channels, uh, sedimentation, contamination uh, of the sediment, um, tailing piles. Um, and uh, fortunately, the upper San Joaquin uh, River uh, did not have these major impacts. California becomes a state in 1850 and the population continues to grow. People stayed here after the uh, gold rush and the valley becomes a place to grow food for the growing population. So those who needed irrigation began to create small irrigation reservoirs and uh, dig hand dug canals out of those reservoirs and out of the rivers. And they would uh, create a weir uh, in, the, uh, in the river and divert water into those large dry spaces between the rivers. Um, as irrigation uh, grows, the, at the same time, uh, water rights become a big issue. The first arrivals had simply appropriated all the water they needed or wanted, uh, and what was left was for people who came after them. If you were too late uh, to, the, to the party, you got nothing. And uh, that's um, the, that's, really the basis for the appropriation of water rights doctrine that we live with today. So eventually California adopts that doctrine as, as, um, um, as a way to control water rights. Very different than the riparian water rights doctrine of the uh, East Coast. The key phrase in the appropriation uh, doctrine is first in time, first in right. If you get there first, 
and uh, no one's been on the river, you can appropriate as much as you want. And uh, that's a system that we live with down to today. And for those without a surface water um, right, unfortunately, over the last hundred years or so, they have gone to groundwater pumping. And that's gotten worse and worse, leading to other problems like subsidence. Basically, where the groundwater was at 20 feet down in the early days, it's now at 200 feet. And where the groundwater was 100 feet down, it's at 1,000 feet or 2,000 feet uh, now. So this is an unsustainable system, and the state is beginning to address that now. So in the early 1900s, uh, there were new demands uh, for water. The cities around the bay decided that uh, they were not going to be able to grow without a sustainable water source. So they went to the source of the water in this system. They went to the high Sierras, they built dams and aqueducts. So we have the Hetch Hetchy Aqueduct taking water to San Francisco and the uh, Aqueduct uh, taking water to the East Bay. Shortly thereafter, around the 1930s or so, the federal government begins surveys of all the appropriate dam sites throughout California and particularly here in the San Joaquin River Basin. This drives a furious period of 50 years of dam building and you'll see uh, on the next slide how this changed the system. Basically, over this time period, 22 significant dams are built uh, just in uh, the, the San Joaquin uh, drainage basin. Uh, as shown here, I've uh, uh, drawn in only the lower dams in each of the rivers. Uh, some rivers had one dam, some rivers had two. The San Joaquin um, above Fresno, where you see the uh, blue dot, uh, had seven major significant dams uh, in the system. So the impact uh, of this is that once you have, are storing water, then you have greater opportunity to divert it. And so water was diverted uh, from the lower dams uh, and it was also diverted from the rivers. Now that the flood flows were less, uh, you could easy, more easily divert water from the rivers and this began a construction of uh, irrigation canals, which has continued uh, to the point where today we have thousands of miles of irrigation canals between uh, the river basins and in the, in the river basins. So the impact of first storing and then diverting the water for irrigation uh, across the system uh, results in reduced river flows, uh, wetlands were eliminated, Levees were tightened up, reducing channel capacity in the natural channels. Riparian forests were removed in many cases, and this had huge uh, impacts on habitat and species. Now I'm gonna go through this system, again from the south to the north, and uh, describe what has happened to the system. To the right, you see the, uh, the Kern River, and as it flows down out of the mountains, it disappears. 100% of the Kern River goes into irrigation canals. And it's only that one year out of every decade or so where you have enough water that can't be diverted uh, so that there's water in the Kern River and flowing down across the valley. All the channels leading north up through Goose Lake to the Tulare Lake Basin uh, are gone. They're, they're dry. The channels may still be there. They may still be shown on maps as, as uh, channels, uh, but the Tulare Lake is gone. The rivers coming into the Tulare Lake Basin, Tule, Kawea, and particularly the Kings, um, saw their waters captured in irrigation basins and distributed out for the benefits of irrigation. And you see very few um, uh, aspects of the original system left here. The uh, channel, uh, the uh, Kings River Channel leading north from the Tulare Lake Basin is seldom has any water in it. Again, about every decade or so in high water years, there is too much water coming down the Kings River and it's diverted out of the Tulare Lake Basin in the old channel into Fresno Slough and joins the uh, San Joaquin River. 
The problem with this is when you have high flow in the Kings River, you also have high flow in the San Joaquin River. And so where the rivers come together, the, the flows would uh, easily overwhelm the, uh, the remaining natural channel. And for this uh, reason, the uh, Chowchilla Bypass, East Side Bypasses were created to take water out of the San Joaquin River and move it around this section of the river and then bring it back to the river further on. Now below, below um, uh, Mendota and the San Joaquin River and the Kings River coming together, uh, each of the tributaries adds water uh, to the system, but each tributary has been modified um, in one way or another. And each one has its own story to tell. We won't go through uh, all of that. Now, you do see the names of the significant reservoirs on this uh, map. So now we have the dams in place. Um, local irrigation systems are in each uh, river basin, confined to the river basin because the irrigation canals are flowing by uh, gravity. And we start to look at major conveyance systems to move water across the basins. In the next drawing, you will see um, representation of the conveyance systems um, that move water around. Now in California, moving water from where it, where it is to where it's needed uh, involves taking the water out of the Sierras and moving it from east to west to the coast and taking water out of Northern California and moving it from the north to the south, down the Sacramento River, through the Delta and on further south. The major conveyance system here is clearly the California Aqueduct. And uh, you all know about that. I, I won't spend a lot of time on that. It does have some interesting features. The San Luis Reservoir, a pump storage facility uh, on the aqueduct um, allows water to be pumped up into the reservoir when there's excess electricity in the system and then uh, released during those high periods of electrical usage uh, in the summer. Um, so the water returns to the forebay and to the aqueduct, except that not all of it goes back to the aqueduct. You see the uh, other conduits, uh, conveyance systems, taking water to the uh, central coast. And that happens in other places up and down the aqueduct. Hey, Bart, about the all aqueduct. apologies, Bart. This is Josh. Uh, you've got about one minute left. Okay. And, and the other thing about the aqueduct is you have interconnections uh, all along it between the other systems. Now, let's focus on Friant for a second. So at Friant, above uh, Fresno here by the dot, you'll um, see the canals. The, the water, as, as indicated before, uh, is distributed about, uh, the, the plan for operating Friant is about uh, 90 plus percent of the water each year would be sent uh, north in the Madera Canal or south in the Friant Kern Canal to provide primarily irrigation water to the, uh, the farmers on the uh, east side of uh, the valley. Um, about five or six percent of the water on an annual basis was still released into the natural channel of the San Joaquin to flow down to provide uh, for the water rights for the people that held water rights in the first 25 miles or so of the river. Beyond that, as you head toward Mendota, the river dries up and you have about 20 miles of, of dry river on a regular uh, uh, normal year. Um, now, what this does is takes the water away from those early appropriation water rights holders further down the river, primarily from the Miller and Lux cattle empire of the 1880s, and they need to be made whole. So the federal government then creates a pumping station in the south end of the uh, Delta and uses the Delta Mendota Canal to convey water up into the Mendota pool behind the old run of the river dam at Mendota, where it's released out into a large number of canals uh, at that dam, and some is released into the river to flow down to uh, other canals. So uh, the bottom line is, let's look at the, the uh, hydrograph that we uh, have uh, left in the um, San Joaquin River. In this last slide, 
we'll show you hopefully in a minute what the hydrograph looks like. Okay. All right, so in this chart that we show, uh, the blue the blue line shows the natural hydrograph of uh, the water uh, coming into uh, Friant Dam. With the storage upstream at Friant, uh, that hydrograph is flattened uh, to the green line and, and extended out through the summer. Um, once you divert the water into the Madeira Canal and the Friant Current Canal, you end up with the hydrograph below Friant Dam that looks a lot like the red line with about that five to seven percent of the water annually in the river. Again, this is a normal year. Uh, once every decade, you have flood flows and this uh, this goes up. So the, the bottom line is we have uh, dry areas of the San Joaquin River uh, in a couple spots. We have uh, delta water uh, being pumped up uh, into Mendota Pool and you can easily see uh, that along with the dams uh, creates the certainly a difficulty for passage of the anadromous fish. So I'm going to finish up with one last slide here that shows a couple photos. One of what uh, the natural system might have looked like and down below you'll see what most of the surface water uh, looks like these days as it gets transported around the San Joaquin Basin. This slide happens to be from the Tulare Lake Basin. And as a, uh, as a, to wrap this up, um, the, the bottom line is that uh, uh, nothing about this system is simple anymore. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bart. Much appreciated. We're gonna move on to our next speaker, uh, Aaron Strange. Uh, is going to give a talk. It's a long haul and spring runner leading the way. Aaron has 27 years of experience as a fisheries biologist working on anadromous fish issues in the Central Valley of California. Uh, she joined the National Oceanographic uh, and Atmospheric Administration uh, fisheries team in Sacramento in 2003 and has since become an expert in Endangered Species Act implementation habitat conservation planning, and large-scale fish habitat restoration. She is currently the San Joaquin River Branch Supervisor at NOAA Fisheries and the Agency's Program Manager for the San Joaquin River Restoration Program. Erin has a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Biology Zoology from Humboldt State University and a Master's of Science degree in Ecology, Evolution, and Conservation from Sacramento State University. Welcome, Erin. Thanks, Josh, and good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about the importance of the San Joaquin River to anadromous fish of the Central Valley of California. Anadromous fish are those that are born in freshwater rivers, migrate to the ocean where they grow and mature to adults and return to freshwater to reproduce. I'll be focusing on spring and fall run Chinook salmon today, which are the focal species for the San Joaquin River Restoration Program. I'll also be talking about two other anadromous fish species that live in the Central Valley of California, steelhead and green sturgeon, and how we think the restoration effort may benefit those species as well. Like spring run chinook, steelhead and green sturgeon are also listed federally as threatened species. So the San Joaquin River historically, as Bart alluded to, provide, was um, provided great habitat for anadromous fishes. Because it's a large watershed, um, much of the headwaters are at high elevation above 13,000 feet. This creates a lot of snowpack in the system. So the snow melt in the spring creates cold water temperatures and high flows throughout the spring period and often into the early summer. This created great habitat for spring run Chinook salmon and historic counts of those fish in the watershed were between 200 and 500,000 spawners annually, a large population. We have less documentation of how steelhead use the system, but steelhead require similar habitat conditions to spring run Chinook, so we imagine that there was a large population of steelhead here as well. 
fall and Chinook salmon are documented using the watershed in high numbers. And interestingly enough, we have no historical documentation of green sturgeon using the system. So one of the most important pieces of the restoration program is the restoration flow schedule. You'll see here in the top portion of this graph, the flow schedule um, here, and it's designed around It's designed around um, the water year types, which are determined by the amount of snowpack in the upper watershed. So in the top blue section is a wet year representation and down lower in the orange section is a critical low dry year representation. Um, and then below that we have the life history pattern for spring run Chinook salmon here in the blue and fall run Chinook salmon here in the brown. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about how the restoration flows support the salmon life histories. Focusing here in the springtime, this section of the hydrograph is where we have the largest amount of water available, obviously because of that snowpack in the spring. And this really supports adult spring run that are migrating into the river during that spring time period. They need those higher flows to be successful. Also, juvenile spring run and juvenile fall run Chinook are migrating out of the river system during this spring period. So those flows are very important and the restoration flows really support that life history. And then if we look at the fall, for instance, we're here in October, about October 14th. Um, we're in a normal dry year, so right here in the middle, and we do have spring run spawning in the river today. So this fall period is really important for spawning of spring run Chinook and also fall run Chinook would be migrating into the system during this time frame and spawning as well. So this fall period of the flow regime is really important. We have some flexibility for moving water around during this period to support this life history. So I took these two um, life history representations for the two Chinook salmon species and then created a life history pattern very generalized for steelhead here in the red and green sturgeon here in the green just to compare to Chinook and to see how the restoration flow schedule may support these species as well. So focusing on the adult migration and spawning period for steelhead we can see that that overlaps somewhat with fall run Chinook and um, so the is supported by the restoration flows. The steelhead young incubate in their nests um, and hatch out as juveniles in the springtime, similar to the two Chinook salmon species. And as I mentioned, the flow spring period really supports then the migration of juvenile steelhead. For green sturgeon, they're primary, primar primarily migrating, adults are migrating into the system and spawning in the springtime as well. So those high flow periods in the hydrograph really will support that species. So just a quick demonstration about how we think that the restoration flows will be supportive of these two additional anadromous fish species. So quickly, I wanted to walk through the anadromous fish that we've seen in the restoration area so far. So we began releasing restoration flows in 2009. It took some time, obviously, for the river to reestablish and um, reconnect with those flows. So by about 2013, we were ready to start introducing Chinook salmon into the river. We began with fall run Chinook. Fall run Chinook are already in the San Joaquin River system. So we were using other tributaries for spawning. So we were able to capture these fish in the lower section of the restoration area, move them to the upper section below Fryant Dam, which is the spawning reach. So this graph shows you from 2013 to 2016, the numbers of adults that were translocated to the spawning reach, and then in gray, and that number is in blue, and in gray, you can see the number of reds or nests that were documented during that time period. 
we were also able to start her active reintroduction of Spring Run Chinook. Spring Run Chinook were completely extirpated, um, no longer exists in the San Joaquin River system, so we had to actively reintroduce them. We took juveniles from the Feather River Hatchery Spring Run population and started releasing them directly into the river in 2014. And we also took some of those eggs and fish to start jumpstart our population in our conservation hatchery in the San Joaquin River. So by the time we get to 2016, we had enough um, sort of extra adult spring run broodstock from the hatchery to start releasing those adults into the river to observe how they're holding and how they're spawning. Those numbers are represented here in blue. We've continued that effort through to this year, 2020. And then again, in the gray on this graph, you can see the number of reds that have been recorded through the years for spring run spawning, spawners. So obviously we started releasing fish, juvenile fish in 2014 in small numbers. We really began releasing a large number of those juveniles in 2016. So we we're anxiously awaiting for naturally returning spring run to the river. And we finally saw that in 2019. Those numbers are represented here in green, the naturally returning spawners. Um, we had 23 in 2019. This was a very high flow year. So we, we know that we had a lot more adults that actually were able to navigate the entire river and make it to the spawning reach themselves, which is why the red number in 2019 is much higher than what you might expect from the number of fish that we captured. This year we captured 57 um, returning adult spring run. And as I mentioned before, we have fish spawning in the river right now. So far we have 35 reds recorded for this year and we expect to have quite a few more. So just an overview of the other anadromous fish that we have seen in the restoration area. In March of 2019, Monitoring captured a white sturgeon, and we actually captured another white sturgeon this year as well. And here's a picture of a, this beautiful rainbow trout captured in January of 2019. Now this fish is not exhibiting anadromous characteristics that we would expect for a steelhead. A steelhead would be much larger and silvery in color, but it is encouraging to see this healthy, mature male rainbow trout using the restoration area. And then last but not least, we caught our first green sturgeon just this last April in the restoration area. So we've had a lot of success with anadromous fish returning to the restoration area so far. And um, I've lost my ability to advance the slide. There's one more. <laughs> I can't see the on my screen. Thank you. Um, so we've had a lot of success with anadromous fish returning to the watershed, um, but we do have many challenges that we still need to work out and unknown um, unknowns. And those are focused on water temperature management, particularly in the late spring through fall when we have low flow periods. And in those dry and critical dry years when we don't have a lot of flow, we'll have to figure out how to support anadromous fish through those periods. There's a lot of uncertainty around how fall run Chinook and spring run Chinook will interact with each other in the river when they're both present. And we're currently in the process of designing adequate fish passage for all of these anadromous fish um, in, with the major barriers that we have in the river today. And we're uncertain about how steelhead and sturgeon will or can use the restored river, and only time will give us answers to some of these things. Next slide. There's my cursor. So thank you, and I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of this panel session. Thank you very much, Aaron. We're going to move on to our next speaker, uh, Gerald Hatler. Gerald began working with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in 1997. His experience has ranged from conducting biological studies to evaluate salmon survival, habitat conditions, fish passage to stream resource evaluations, species and habitat protection, and public use of natural resources. He's been involved with salmon restoration projects on the Stanislaus, 
the Tuolumne and Merced Rivers, and most recently, the San Joaquin River. He has been the CDFW lead on the San Joaquin River Restoration Program since 2007 and manages the CDFW effort to assist with implementation of the program settlement agreement. Gerald also oversees five state fish hatcheries and the CDFW fisheries program in 12 counties from the Central Coast to the Sierra. The title of his talk is Hatchery Development, Operations and Conservation Strategies. The floor is yours, Gerald. Thank you. And don't forget your camera as well, please. Aha, uh -huh. here we go. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, yeah, so good morning. I'm the fisheries program manager for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife Central Region. Before I move into details regarding the hatchery, I want to mention briefly why river restoration is important. When it comes to restoration, there are three important components that we need to think about water management, public use, and biodiversity. All three are inextricably linked and share a need for water, which is California's most precious resource. It's all a bit of a balancing act, but if you can find a way to meet all these needs, restoration will lead to sustainability. So sustainability should be at the forefront of the fundamental need for water. The more you come to understand these competing needs, it becomes clear the current situation on the San Joaquin River isn't sustainable for anyone. Hopefully you'll walk away from this meeting with a better understanding of what's needed to restore the river and why and what our challenges are. But in the context of developing a hatchery, you need to talk about fish numbers and how the hatchery can support the population goals. Historically, it's estimated that the San Joaquin River may have had as many as half a million returning spring run adults in any given year. Once large scale development began and many of our streams and rivers were divert, diverted or developed for storage, the adult spawning population dropped significantly and by the early 1920s, we have reliable estimates of the population decreasing to less than 250,000. As water development projects expanded and grew, along with other activities affecting their populations, spring run on the San Joaquin River effectively became extinct or extirpated in the context of the overall Central Valley spring run populations. So this is what we have to start with. Most biologists are accustomed to working in systems with dangerously small at-risk populations and a small number of Chinook salmon have been observed straying into the upper San Joaquin River in very wet years, but the task has been to build something where nothing exists. However, the fact that the salmon have managed to use the San Joaquin River under the right conditions and we've already documented a small number of returns from experimental fish releases since the program began, I think it's a pretty good indication that we're on the right path. Nevertheless, I think it then makes sense that simply increasing flows and building channel capacity isn't going to get the program where it needs to go. It's almost impossible to answer questions about fish passage limitations, habitat needs, and other unforeseeable limitations without some kind of fish population to work with. It's also difficult to see a project of this scope and magnitude through without something to kickstart the population and help the program with a focused timeline that has tangible and achievable goals. Therefore, it was determined very early in the program that a hatchery would be needed for the program to succeed. The program also needed to determine how many fish would be needed to achieve a sustainable population of Chinook salmon. The program technical advisory committee developed recommendations for both spring run and fall run Chinook salmon. These recommendations took into consideration historic and current conditions on the San Joaquin River, as well as conditions supporting Chinook salmon on other rivers and what it would take to achieve a minimum viable population on the San Joaquin. The recommendations seek to establish 30,000 returning spring run adults and 10,000 fall run adults with a capacity to, for 45,000 and 15,000 adults respectively. In recent times, hatcheries haven't been without controversy. And in 2012, a hatchery scientific review group analyzed practices and made recommendations to improve hatchery operations and practices statewide. Those principles were incorporated into the program's restoration and hatchery goals, and along with the program's fisheries management plan and hatchery and genetic management plan, the program developed a strategy that would avoid some of the ongoing concerns about hatchery operations, and we came up with goals that would promote genetic diversity while safeguarding against negative genetics effects, such as founders effects, inbreeding, and risk of extinction from catastrophic events, as well as negative effects of out-of-basin and non-target populations. 
We're also seeking to establish populations that would be self-sustaining and be specifically adapted to conditions in the San Joaquin River to allow natural selection to operate on the population such that the physical and behavioral characteristics of the population, including factors such as timing of upstream migration, spawning, and outmigration, will be unique to the San Joaquin River. Another sign of a healthy population would be to have multiple age classes present, which would indicate resilience between different brood years. And finally, we would want to observe less than 15% of the reintroduced salmon as hatchery of origin 10 years following reintroduction in a restored system. So to work towards our population targets, it was determined that a hatchery would need to produce 1 million juveniles for release in the San Joaquin River each year. This can be achieved by collecting less than 3,000 eggs or juveniles from source populations and then bringing them into a hatchery to rear and spawn when they become sexually mature. So when we consider collections for the hatchery, the program is looking at both extant populations and donor watersheds and what we believe to be strays and other systems. The goal is to increase the genetic diversity of our hatchery stocks by collecting from as many different populations as possible. This will also minimize impacts to the source populations as spring run populations are not doing well wherever you find them in the state. As mentioned on the previous slide, the total take for all populations combined would be a maximum of 2,700 each year. Now, when it comes time to spawn the fish that we've collected, the program will have conducted genetic analysis for all of the individual fish that we intend to spawn. This is a spawning matrix that shows females at the topmost row and different males in the column below them. The males are sorted by a genetic relatedness factor with the least related males at the top. So as you get to the bottom of each column, the males are more strongly related to the female at the top of each column. To increase the genetic diversity of their offspring, the least related males at the top of the column will be spawned with that female. So we needed to find a suitable location to construct the new hatchery with access to the river and a reliable water supply. We located the facility in the shaded area seen here adjacent to the San Joaquin Trout Hatchery just below Millerton Lakes Bryant Dam on the San Joaquin River near the town of Bryant. This is approximately 20 miles from the city of Fresno. Now here's a, an artist rendering of what the program is calling the Salmon Conservation and Research Facility or SCARF. Construction began on the facility in 2017 and we currently anticipate completion around 2022. Unlike most of our hatcheries, which were constructed over 50 years ago, the new facility will incorporate circular tanks as opposed to the flow through raceways typically seen at most hatcheries in operation today. This allows for a more controlled fishery and environment and more efficient water use. It will also have expanded work areas that will provide research and laboratory workspace. Now, on the river side of the facility, we have an interim facility that enabled CDFW to implement pilot activities as proof of concept for conservation strategies and begin experiments with fishery introduction for the program. The interim facility began operations in 2010 and will continue through construction. We're currently operating at capacity by producing up to 250,000 juveniles for studies and experimental releases. While we're currently collecting spring run juveniles from the Feather River Hatchery just below Lake Orville, eventually we will seek to collect juveniles from the wild. We've considered multiple collection methods, but we're currently planning on utilizing rotary screw traps seen here, since we're able to minimize disturbance of spawning reds, and we anticipate being able to collect a small number of juveniles throughout the natural spawning period. This will further minimize impacts to the seasonal spawning population and source streams and increase the genetic diversity of juveniles collected. Once the fish are collected, they will be reared in increasingly larger tanks until they reach sexual maturity approximately three years later. When the fish are sexually mature, eggs are extracted from females and are inseminated with milk, which contains sperm from the males. The fertilized eggs are placed in incubation trays until fry emerge. And as the fry grow larger, they're moved into larger rearing tanks until they're big enough for tagging and then eventually for release into the San Joaquin River. Now, this is a very basic overview of operations, but both the interim facility and eventually the SCARF enable the program to conduct various experiments and implement practices that so far have allowed CDFW to control growth and maturation and implement practices to produce healthy and genetically robust fish for reintroduction. If the program is successful, the day may come when an angler can legally hold one of these beautiful spring run Chinook salmon in their hands, just like one of our hatchery employees here in this picture. 
So if you jump back to the reasons why restoration is important, having a robust population of spring run on the San Joaquin River would indicate that the program has succeeded in restoring a resource that can meet everybody's needs. So I'll be on with some of my staff to answer questions at the end of the panel session, but I appreciate your time and interest uh, in what we're doing and thank you very much. Thank you, Gerald. Our next speaker is Dr. Oliver Burgess. Uh, Dr. Oliver Burgess Towns, as we know him, is the lead fish biologist for the program. Prior to that, he was a fish biologist in Reclamation's Bay Delta office, working on real-time and ongoing water operations issues, and was a supervisory fisheries biologist for the Army Corps of Engineers on the Snake River in Washington. His professional interests focus on aquatic ecology with an emphasis on anthropogenic disturbances to aquatic communities. He received a BS from the Marine Science Program at the University of South Carolina and an MS and PhD from the Department of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences at the University of Florida. Towns, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Josh. There I am. Uh, let me switch over to all right yeah so good morning um uh, thanks for the introduction josh uh, for those of you who don't know me my name is towns burgess i'm the lead fish biologist for the restoration program and i have been with the restoration program since uh, february of 2019 so i haven't been here too long but there's been a lot of exciting stuff that's happened since then uh today i'm going to be giving a oh, whoops uh, apologize for that. There we go. Uh, today I'm going to be giving an overview of uh, of the 2019-2020 uh, spring run returns to the San Joaquin River. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. There we go. And uh, this is going to be a high-level overview, so uh, it's co it's connected to a lot of uh, other posters and talks that'll be occurring uh, taking place during uh, the science meeting this year uh, uh, this time. So I uh, appreciate if you'd hang around and see some of the other talks. Uh, spring run Chinook salmon have a fascinating um, life cycle. Uh, they have uh, some of these life history characteristics that make them um, resilient to uh, unpredictable conditions that they may be faced, uh, such as poor ocean conditions and, and uh, drought that may occur. Uh, but with the construction of uh, Bryant Dam and the operation of Bryant Dam, the San Joaquin River uh, uh, in significant portions was running dry uh, in most years. And um, this condition in the river disrupted the life cycle of, of spring run Chinook salmon, ultimately leading to their uh, extirpation in the river. So uh, today I'm going to be uh, focused on uh, in, in this area of the life cycle where it's got the uh, ocean adults uh, uh, into the spawning adults. And I'm going to be using um, these returning adults as a, a metric of, of progress that the program has made uh, towards um, uh, uh, restoring fish in good condition and uh, creating a, a naturally reproducing self-sustaining population. So there's several challenges that salmon need to overcome uh, uh, in order uh, for us to restore them back to the river. And uh, obviously one of them is inadequate flows. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the river was running dry for um, uh, many, many years. and um, uh, the settlement that, that Don and others have mentioned earlier today uh, that created the restoration program uh, calls for these restoration flows. So um, we have the flows available to us, but what we need to do is we have to shape that hydrograph uh, to provide the appropriate cues for uh, adult salmon to, uh, to return back to the river. And we, the program has the restoration administrator whose um, uh, job is to make recommendations to the program on how to release and shape these flows. So if you'll stick around uh, for a little bit and you can uh, hear a talk uh, uh, by Tom Johnson about how he does this. 
Uh, one of the other issues that uh, salmon need to overcome is high water temperatures. Uh, this is in part due to um, the San Joaquin being the southernmost extent of uh, salmon populations in, in North America, but it also has to do with um, uh, the nature of impounded rivers and the effect that, that dams on river have in increasing water temperatures throughout the, the stream. Some of the other systems that we have in the Central Valley, if you think of reservoirs like uh, uh, up at Shasta, they have uh, significant um, cold water pools available to them that they reserve and release these flows to manage temperatures for, um, for some of the salmon populations that, that spawn below Shasta Dam. But uh, Millerton Reservoir is, is rather small um, uh, compared to its annual discharge. So it, it's difficult for, uh, for Millerton to establish a significant cold water pool that we can use to manage high water temperatures. Uh, one of the other major challenges that salmon have to overcome it are uh, some of the physical barriers that exist on the river. So um, I told you that we've addressed flow and temperature in some part through the restoration flows, but um, these barriers prevent the volitional passage, which is a, a, a key component for us to establish uh, a self-sustaining population. So the settlement calls for improvements to some of these uh, high priority um, passage impediments, including um, uh, bypass around Mendota Dam, um, fish passage at Sac Dam, and improvements to the east side bypass. And again, I'd, I'd ask you to stick around uh, for later in the session when we uh, have some talks about some of these uh, passage improvements. And then some of the other uh, challenges that salmon need to overcome as they're migrating through the system uh, are these false pathways. So um, if, if spring run, as they return back, if they head uh, down some of these false pathways, it's gonna lead them to habitat that is, uh, that is poor condition for them. And ultimately uh, the fate of these fish heading there, down there is, is likely to perish before they spawn. So as I mentioned, we've begun managing um, uh, flow requirements and temperature requirements, uh, primarily through the release of restoration flows. But uh, what about these passage barriers and, and false pathways? So as I said, uh, we've started to design and construct some of these uh, projects to improve that. But in the meantime, um, until we achieve full volitional passage through the, uh, uh, throughout the river, um, we're going to be conducting trap and haul efforts. So essentially in the upper part of the map, uh, uh, this is where the spring run initially come into the river at the confluent or uh, come into the restoration area at the confluence of the Merced and the San Joaquin. And um, as they move into the river, we capture them and then we transport them around some of these passage impediments and release them um, into the area down towards the bottom of the map uh, where their spawning grounds um, are and where the cooler water is released from Friant Dam. So zooming in towards the top of that uh, map that I was showing previously, um, you can see where we deploy some of the gear to uh, collect these adult uh, fish as they return. So uh, some of these red points are locations where we have deployed our gear and uh, it, it's spread throughout the river, uh, including some of these false migration uh, pathways. And then typically what we do is deploy the, the, the gear up to the um, uh, uh, furthest upstream extent of volitional passage for a given year. So in some years that's been um, uh, in the vicinity of the Eastside Bypass control structure, and in other years that's been um, at Sac Dam. And some of the gear that, uh, that we deploy, um, we, we've deployed various gears, uh, including net weirs with traps behind them and, and video cameras, but primarily we uh, uh, relied upon fight nets uh, and fight traps. So pike nuts, uh, like you can see here in the image, um, they're uh, a little bit smaller, four to six feet. Uh, we use them in, in some of the shallower water and in lower flow conditions. And they have these wing walls deployed out to the side that will guide fish towards the trap. And then we also have these fike traps, which are much larger in diameter. Uh, we can use them in deeper water, uh, higher flow conditions, but they don't have wing walls. 
And if all goes well here, I have a, a time-lapse video that I'm gonna show you of uh, uh, how a bike trap is deployed. As you can see, they're, they're pretty large traps. And also note that uh, uh, there's no wing walls on there. So typically, as we're deploying these traps, we, we try to put them in locations where the uh, river channel is uh, somewhat constricted and that the trap will take up a, a lot of the area. So the traps have been out, out fishing and uh, we allow them to fish for 24 hours and then we do a trap check. And again, uh, I just want you to note that the size of these traps, they're quite large. And then towards the back, as the fish would move uh, through this throat area and get captured in the back, there's a, there's a good bit of room in here for the fish to move around. And uh, one of the advantages of that is, is it reduces the stress uh, of the fish while they're in the trap before we can remove them. So what do we do if we catch a fish? And you saw this image on the left earlier. This was the, the uh, first returning spring run that we captured. Um, when we check these traps, uh, uh, any of the spring run in there, they get first priority over any of the fish. So we, uh, we take those fish and we put them in one of these haul tanks that you see over here on the right. And then we transport them down to the release location. So once we get to that release site, um, we will scan the fish for uh, uh, any tags that may be in there. We're also looking for uh, any marks. Tags could include pit tags, um, coated wire tags, uh, uh, external tags. There also could be uh, adipose fin clips. And then after we've checked them for any existing tags, we add our own set of tags to them. So again, we will, um, we will either uh, put, put a pit tag in them, um, we may put an external tag like you're seeing right here, and occasionally we put some of them, um, uh, we'll put a telemetry tag inside of them, an acoustic tag where we can track the fish's movement. And then we release the fish. And you know that's a, that's a really exciting part. And uh, uh, when we release the fish, we uh, are allowing them the opportunity to, um, we're, we're allowing them to uh, uh, adjust to the cooler temperature that they're gonna find down on reach one, uh, a, a, as well as to select some of the holding habitat that, uh, that they're gonna be using. Oops. And here's a quick video of, uh, of how a release would occur. I apologize if it's a little choppy on your end. The camera's a little bit of a distance away from the fish, so um, it, the, the river seems a bit murkier than it actually is. As the fish sort of uh, indicates that it's ready to swim off, um, they'll release it and there it goes. So uh, as it's been mentioned earlier, uh, the exciting news is that uh, on April 9, 2019, we did capture our uh, uh, first returning adult spring run and this provided the first evidence um, of uh, spring round migration in the San Joaquin River since they were extirpated. But we still have some challenges that we need to face. Uh, this figure shows some of the temperatures that uh, were recorded near the east side bypass in 2019 and 2020. So the blue line is 2019 and the orange line is 2020. And then we ha I have stars marked on there with uh, corresponding colors to indicate the first and last um, uh, capture of spring run during that time. As well as I've got some marks on here, some bands indicating um, some of the uh, uh, adult migration temperature objectives that the program uses. So the green uh, line down here at the bottom is uh, for uh, is optimal uh, uh, temperature. The yellow sort of band there is um, uh, critical temperature, and then the red band are lethal temperatures. 
And you can see that uh, during much of the spring migration window, um, uh, the temperatures fall into sort of that um, critical and, and lethal temperature range. So uh, we know we've still got some challenges that were faced there, but um, we're always looking for opportunities to improve, uh, uh, make improvements here, um, either through uh, flow releases, you know, flow operations and reservoir management or through uh, riparian shading. And then here's a couple of other figures that I have uh, showing some results of the, of the 2019 and 2020 returns. So in 2019, as uh, Aaron mentioned earlier, we did have uh, 23 fish return. Uh, those are the blue bars you're seeing uh, in, the, in the left graph. And uh, as you know, uh, the weekly capture totals increased towards the end of the season. And as it was mentioned, that was, a, that was an interesting year because it was a high flow year. We had flood releases and um, uh, we actually had to pull our gear out of the water. But we do have, um, uh, even though we weren't able to sample anymore, we do have some indication from other monitoring locations that, uh, that the fish continue to return uh, through June 20th. And also due to this high water year, um, uh, a lot of these passage uh, barriers uh, were, were overwhelmed by water. And so we did get volitional passage uh, during that year, which made it a little bit difficult for us to um, uh, have an accurate count of the number of fish that were returning. And then looking at 2020, um, it, was a, it was different than it was in 2019. Uh, we did capture 57 fish and it seemed uh, it, it peaked more towards the er, uh, beginning of May. And um, we did not have flood releases that year. So uh, the 57 that we captured represent um, the total run of fish that we um, uh, received that year. And we ended the season towards the end of May um, uh, after we weren't capturing any more fish. And then just real quickly, looking at the link distribution in the two years, you can see that they were very similar with the vast majority of the fish uh, falling in the 700 to 799 millimeter range. So I'm gonna zip through some of these um, uh, comparisons uh, real quick. Uh, as I mentioned in 2019, you can see that uh, sampling was curtailed due to the high flow events. So our sampling season was uh, April uh, 9th through May 21st. Uh, the peak uh, capture was in the last week but we do know that they uh, uh, spring run continued to migrate. Uh, we captured 23 spring run that year. None were captured in Salt Slough, one of the false migration pathways. And all of the fish that we captured were adipose clip, indicating that they were of hatchery origin. Uh, most of the fish that returned that year were age three, but we did have some age four fish. And um, the male to female ratio was 1.75 to one, excuse me, the female to male ratio which was a little surprising to us because we had um, sort of anticipated that it was gonna be closer to a one-to-one -one ratio. And um, one of the other things is that, as I said, there was volitional passage. So uh, based on reds, we estimate that there was probably 400 plus spawners up there. Um, we had transported 23. Um, like I said, uh, with volitional passage, there were some that moved through on their own but we also add some excess brood stock to the spawning reaches. So that's how we get to this larger number of spawners. And then 2020 was a different year. The sampling was not curtailed. Um, we had a, a, a peak capture in the first week of May. Um, there were a total of 57 captured. Again, most of them were age three, some were age four. Uh, we also got some returns from both yearlings and smolts that were released in reach five as well as smolts that were released in REACH-1. And this is really exciting news that I'll dig into a little bit further. Also, we found that eight out of the 57 that returned had uh, adipose present. And uh, as far as the female to male ratio, it was two to one. Again, that was surprising. And uh, those fish are up there in the, spawning, uh, in the spawning reaches right now. And we estimate that there's approximately 330 of them. So, how do we use this information to inform the restoration program? Sounds. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, you've got about one minute left. Okay. Yep. This is it. Um, first of all, it was just exciting to find out that Spring Run will return to the restoration uh, area. Uh, uh, we put a lot of work into um, uh, releasing the fish, as Gerald was referring to, and uh, we're we're releasing restoration flows. So it's just good to see that we're getting some return on that investment. 
Uh, we've also noted that different water years are uh, providing some challenges, as I said, um, with 2019 and 2020. Uh, there were some differences there that created challenges for us, but they also provide us opportunities to, to, to learn. So um, uh, we've also uh, been able to use this as an opportunity to refine uh, our trap and haul methods um, as we uh, work through um, where we're gonna tag those fish. Uh, do we tag them at the collection site? Do we tag them at the rest, uh, release location? And also we've adjusted where we release the fish so that we can um, maximize the uh, survival of these fish through the trap and haul program. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've also um, seen juveniles uh, successfully migrate out of reach one. And this is, this is a key component because as we reach that full volitional passage, we need to see the fish that spawn in reach one, we need to see the juveniles migrate all the way out of the system in order for us to have that self-sustaining population. And so we were really excited to uh, have documentation of a juvenile that was released uh, in reach one, make it out of the restoration area and return as adult. We've also seen um, multiple age classes return, like I said, the age three and four fish, as well as some of these diff different life history characteristics. We've seen fish that were released as smolts and fish that were released as yearlings, uh, both return to the restoration area. And again, this goes back to that uh, resilient population. Um, if, if we want them to be um, uh, self-sustaining, we need them to be able to handle some of those um, disturbances that they that may exist in the future. And by having this kind of um, diverse uh, age at return and these different life history characteristics, such as yearling and small uh, e-migration, this will all help them remain resilient to any changes that occur in the future. And finally, I'll just end by saying that um, we, we've made some great strides here. We've made some great progress, but we also have some challenges, um, uh, one of them being temperature that I showed you before. Um, we need to maintain adequate flows uh, to the restoration area, and we need to gain um, full volitional passage to uh, uh, for the fish to get access to the spawning grounds. So that's where I'm going to end it, and uh, I'll just say stick around to see some of the other slides and find out how, um, uh, how we're making progress in the restoration program. Thank you. Thank you, Towns. Much appreciated. Our final speaker in the panel before we get on to the question and answer session uh, is Donald Donnie Ratcliffe. Uh, Donnie is the Central Valley Supervisor for Fish and Aquatic Conservation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the California Great Basin region. He's had over 20 years of experience working with salmon, steelhead, sturgeon, and other native species and habitats throughout California. Donnie supervises project leaders at the Lodi and Red Bluff Fish and Wildlife Offices, oversees the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service roles in the Central Valley Project Improvement Act and San Joaquin River Restoration Programs. He also coordinates extensively with other U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service programs and our partners throughout the Central Valley on fish and water related issues. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Donnie. All right. Thanks, Josh. Uh, well, I will start by saying uh, I know we're a little behind on time. I'm going to do my dead level best to get us uh, caught back up as much as I can contribute. Uh, a couple of cliff notes, I guess, for my presentation. Uh, my goal here is just to give you uh, a general overview of kind of what monitoring is currently happening or has been happening the past few years and call out uh, some much more articulate and intelligent folks than myself that will be speaking about those individual aspects over the course of the next two days. Uh, so if you are interested, you might want to take notes. I'll try to give you times uh, and names of the presenters. All right, next slide. Okay, and I'm going to try to do this uh, sort of in the, the order of that life history that uh, Tao showed you in the picture there uh, related to Spring Run. Uh, one caveat uh, I noticed this morning when I finally got my slides turned in that uh, the first two items, the adult return monitoring and the adult holding monitoring are actually flipped in the next two slides. So I'll do those uh, slightly in reverse order. Okay, so uh, adult holding, which happens right after they return. So there's my mistake. Um, this monitoring is especially important for Spring Run Chinook uh, because as was mentioned earlier, they have a very interesting life history uh, you know, among the runs of Chinook that we have in the Central Valley. 
uh, in that you know they're returning in the spring and then they're holding uh, through a pretty tough time of year when water temperatures are rising, air temperatures are rising, and water inflow to the river uh, may be waning depending on the snowmelt cycle naturally and or how dams are operated as we move throughout the course of the summer. So this monitoring is done for the most part uh, to track those fish that have been at this point translocated to reach one or past if we're able to, to tag them uh, volitionally, which is, hasn't been done so far, but maybe something we can look into in the future. This is to both you know, assess how, many of, uh, how they're surviving, uh, but more importantly, how they're interacting with the habitat conditions in that particular year type. Uh, again, this generally happens in the March to September time period as we capture the adults uh, and translocate them up, uh, move them up to reach one. And so uh, if you are interested, there is a talk um, tomorrow at 1020 um, by Mike Grill from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife that'll get much more in depth here. So next slide. So before they hold, they return. Uh, this monitoring has been done several ways throughout the years. It was alluded to earlier. Um, previously, the Fish and Wildlife Service has deployed net weirs with a Baki River Watcher, uh, which is basically a computerized system that, allow, that we funnel fish through a, a corridor that has that can detect fish passing through them, gives us silhouettes, and in some cases, videos. Uh, we haven't been super successful so far, all kinds of reasons with water flows, et cetera. Um, mostly, the successful monitoring in the last few years has been accomplished via the uh, fight traps, as Towns alluded to earlier. And there's not a presentation, uh, an oral presentation, but there's a poster presentation uh, by Nick and Paul with the Fish and Wildlife Service out of our Lodi office. So if you are interested in that, uh, I would suggest you check out the poster session and, and mark that one down to join. Next, our red and carcass survey. So those adults have returned, they're holding. If all goes well and they survive, um, they're either spawning and we can find their reds or their nests for those that are not salmon uh, fish heads like me. Um, or we find, and then we would find some, subsequently their carcasses if they died after they spawned, or we would find their carcasses if they didn't make it and were not successful in spawning. So the purpose here again is uh, figure out how these fish are interacting with the habitat. In this case, where are they spawning? Uh, time period, flows, depth, velocity of the water that's passing. Uh, and it gives us another assessment of the spawning habitat within that reach one area where the, where the fish primarily hold and spawn. And this is done via boats and kayaks. This year has had to be, been a little interesting at times with water, with air quality and things like that. We've done some land-based surveys, but primarily boats and kayaks, they traverse the river weekly looking for carcasses and, and reds. And so again, if you're not familiar, these are salmon nests. These are big fish. They excavate a large area in the gravel that you can see generally that disturbance uh, where they've freshly dug the gravel up and deposited their eggs. And if you're more interested in this, tomorrow at 1040, uh, there'll be a talk by Austin Demerix out of our Lodi office as well. So next slide. So after spawning, uh, what we hope is that those eggs have incubated in the gravel and uh, something along the or a line of 30-ish days later, we get emergence. Um, so that's where the juveniles uh, would swim up out of the gravel. And we generally assess this with uh, what's known as a red cap. So in the picture there, you see an emergence trap or an emergence, uh, an emergence cap. Uh, and so that's a, a net that is put around the perimeter of the red that's been found and caps it weighted down around the sides, has a skirt on it that goes below the gravel line and then has a little collection box at the back, which would be on the downstream end. So as those little guys are coming up out of the gravel, they're not great swimmers. Uh, the velocity would then push them down into that little collection cup, which is checked daily to make sure that uh, we catch them when they're live and they're not in there too long. So this generally happens from October to February. Uh, it's been happening since 2018. It's too much, it's too labor intensive uh, and, and costly to cap all of them. So a subset of, of reds are capped. Uh, and we, along with the Fish and Wildlife Service crew, along with uh, the rest of the program um, and other folks with the Restor Restoration Administrator and uh, Technical Advisory Committee are working on a trap effects study um, this is, again, the southernmost extent of these fish uh, of Chinook uh, populations on the West Coast. Um, it's different habitat. I mean, these have been deployed in a lot of other places. We have seen some indications that maybe that these traps, that the reds that are capped versus those that aren't, might have some different, uh, differential emergence rates. So uh, that's a, a new thing that will be deployed likely this season. And uh, tomorrow, uh, there's a pop-up talk uh, by Andreas Reich. Um, Covering some of this. Okay, next slide. Uh, 
if we successfully get those juveniles to emerge uh, and they don't just out migrate down a cat to red into that cut that was in the picture there, uh, they're going to at some point uh, out migrate down the river, right? And so we're interested in how, how those fish survive along the river corridor and what their out migration pattern is. Uh, early on, they're not great swimmers. Uh, they tend to be moved along by velocity, but as they grow and begin to feed on their own, uh, in, throughout the Central Valley, there's a range of uh, life history alternatives uh, or uh, choices within individual populations within individual years uh, on how juveniles out migrate, how they utilize habitat along the river corridor, uh, and, and how they progress in their life history as they're headed out to the ocean, utilizing river resources greatly or potentially not as much and moving out quickly. So the idea here is to give us production estimates. How is the spawning going? Are we seeing juveniles? Are they surviving? Are we losing them somewhere along their migration corridor? Uh, and what might that be? Habitat issues, predator issues, uh, and environmental factors that may be you know, affecting these fish year to year, uh, as well as along that, that corridor of migration. So this is accomplished in a couple of ways, uh, rotary screw trapping. So these are large traps that sit out in the river, juveniles, in the subsample of a part of the river corridor, uh, juveniles are moved into this trap via a rotating cone. You can see that there on the upper uh, upper of the two pictures. And then a subset of those fish, so we've been, that rotary screw trapping has been occurring since 2016. Uh, a subset of those fish are then acoustically tagged, uh, and that's to get at that idea of migration rate and survival. And so there are two talks uh, tomorrow at 9.30 talking about the acoustic telemetry, marking those fish and being able to track them. Uh, and then at 9.50, uh, we're talking about the rotary screw trapping. So next slide. And then we wrap that all up into uh, how do we do that now and how do we do that moving forward? And so uh, for quite some time, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service has led along with all of the other uh, agencies within the program and other experts, uh, an effort to put together a long-term monitoring plan. So, you know, there's a lot of need to know stuff here. There's a lot of would like to know stuff here. As physical projects come online and improvements are made and we get more volitional passage, for adults up and juveniles out, there are a lot of areas that we're going to need to monitor in different ways. Uh, so at this point, this plan is really meant to capture what kind of monitoring are we doing? Um, what kind of monitoring do we think we, we absolutely have to do for regulatory purposes, compliance, that kind of stuff? What kinds of monitoring do we need to have uh, to move towards proving we're being successful or not? But then also, you know, what are the nice to have monitoring things? This obviously has to be a living document, um, you know, returning water and salmon to a river that's been dry for decades, for the most part, is no small task. And so figuring out exactly how to monitor, where to monitor. And if you go back to Don's introduction, doing that in the world of a, what we call the funding constraint framework and trying to figure out uh, how to pay for this. It's not as expensive as a lot of the physical projects, but it's still expensive. So this is a document that's about to be completed uh, for the first time, but I say completed with some quotes in that it's a living document that will be changed through time as we see how things evolve and figure out priority-wise what we can afford to and not afford to monitor and what we need to uh, versus want to monitor. And so that will be Dr. Lauren Yamani um, has a pop-up talk tomorrow, uh, and she's leading at this point the services effort on that plan. So with that, I am done. Thank you. Well, you're not done yet, Donnie. Please keep your camera on and uh, let's get all of the panelists to please turn their cameras on. We're gonna move into the Q&A session now for this panel. Um, I always like to uh, start off with a question when I'm the moderator. So uh, I'm gonna pose one right now. Um, we've got water, we've got fish, um, and hopefully soon as we saw with the funding constraint framework, we'll be having passage, volitional passage for those fish. Um, and I, I wanted to pose a prognostication question to everyone. And so asking you to put on your soothsayer caps and look into your crystal ball and tell us, what is your vision for the river 10 years down the road from now? Um, and also, what, what are the challenges in getting uh, to what you see happening in the decade? Who'd, who'd ever like to go first, please have at it. Oh, well, I'll jump in there real quick. Uh, 10 years from now, I would like to see uh, uh, full volitional passage. So I'd like a lot of the to see that um, uh, many of the major passage impediments, um, ha we have some way of, for fish to get around them uh, on their own. 
And as I've mentioned uh, in my talk, that's, you know, that is one of the, the key components uh, because if we want to go hands off with these fish uh, in the long run to have that naturally reproducing self-sustaining population, one of those key components is for the fish to be able to make it to the spawning grounds on their own. So for me personally, that's one of the things I would like to see. And that obviously involves a lot of planning, uh, some construction projects and some difficult tasks we need to face. Yeah, and I would tag on to, to, to as a fish guy, as to what Towns said there eloquently and speaks right to my heart, but now as, as more of a paper pushing manager to say, uh, nothing breeds success like success. And I would love to see the 10 years from now, we're, uh, we're somehow using the fish to leverage ourselves out of the phase of, of just trying to figure out how to get volitional passage and, and monitor as much as we can. And, and we're running around the world bragging about, look at what we did and trying to figure out how we, uh, we fend off the people trying to throw money at us to, to go do the extra cool stuff with habitat and additional monitoring and, and pass this uh, hump of just trying to get the get our arms around the really hard stuff, which is no small task. And, and I couldn't be prouder of being associated with the program, but I'd love to see us moving on to a phase that maybe uh, maybe we can really move towards the vision of, I think, what people thought of full river restoration was. Um, so I hope we hit that turning point in the next 10 years. That stuff doesn't get too expensive and, and prices out of the market. Yeah, I, I think I would concur with what both Donnie and, and Town said. You know, one of the things I would mention, and this is uh, one of our early colleagues on the program, Michelle Workman, worked for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She had a really good take, I think, on on what can be expected. You know, there's been a lot of a lot of focus on our on our timelines and specific goals, and I think it is important to remember that it it took a long time for the river to get to the point where it is now. And so um, this is very much a long-term project. And I think our expectations should take that into consideration. Um, and Michelle had a great phrase. She said, you know, um, restoration is a process, it's not an event. And so there was a lot of focus on specific actions, but it's definitely a long-term process. But with what both Donnie and, and Town said is, we we can see things happening already with the work that we're doing and as we continue to work, move forward on the project um i think i think we'll have a, a better sense of what needs to happen and we can measure success as we move along but it's going to take a while for us to do that you're on mute john i'd like to see some challenges here in the near future, uh, Josh, I, I'd like to see us have a problem of too many fish in reach one where we need to, uh, you know, uh, augment that gravel, get additional spawning habitats, uh, you know, present the challenge of not enough holding habitat, all these factors that people, you know, uh, you know, told us that probably would be an issue in the future. Uh, I think we have a lot of work to do before we get there, though. Obviously, we have uh, major construction efforts, uh, you know, uh, underway, we're design or at least we're designing uh, these these fish passage structures over some pretty large impediments, a couple of dams and control structures. But here, certainly in the next few years, by 2025, 2026, and in that time, we're going to have a volitional passage for our fish to make it up on their own. And not only the salmon, you know, the, the lamprey, the sturgeon, the steelhead, if they're present, all these fish making it up to the reach one. Uh, the, we didn't talk about reaches yet, but the area below Friant Dam where spawning is, is likely to occur for these species. So let's hope that we're successful. And let's hope that we have uh, lots of problems like this uh, in, in the future. So um, that, that's, where I, that's where I think we're going in 10 years. Okay, this is Craig Moyle. Uh, just we have a few questions to come into the chat, into the questions tab. Uh, we will be responding to all questions. If we don't have enough time, we'll just come back to you on email. Uh, first one, we have a pair from Peter Forrester from the Bay Institute, uh, Ferdinand, Aaron, and Towns. Uh, Aaron, uh, as you noted in your presentation, 23 returning spring run were trapped in 2019, but far more made it all the way up to uh, spawn. What is the current estimate of the total number of spring run that can complete their life cycle in 2019? Uh, is 57 the estimate for 2020 spring run that completed their full life cycle? 
So Talon's essentially answered that first question for the number of fish returning in 2019 with an estimate of 400 plus. It's difficult for us to estimate exactly how many fish were in the system. Um, so based on the number of reds, we have a kind of broad estimate of 400 plus for 2019. And then for 2020, the number of 57 adults, um, I don't think will change because this was a low flow period this year. And so we don't expect that any adults made it on their own to the spawning reach. So I think that number, you know, will stay right around 57. Okay. Uh, Towns, could you also clarify what is meant by age three and age four? Uh, yeah, um, I guess I don't know how to add too much uh, uh, too much to that statement. I mean, generally speaking, uh, what we see in some of the other systems like uh, Butte Creek and some of the other ones is that um, uh, fish uh, salmon can return anywhere, you know, from uh, as a uh, age two, age three, uh, age four. Uh, in, in some of these other systems like View Creek, we've seen the vast majority of them uh, can be, uh, are typically like age three, or uh, in some years it, it might be age four. <clears throat> I really, um, I'm not sure how to clarify that too much more uh, than to say that that, that is the uh, age of the fish. And so, uh, you know, they depending on how long they stayed in the river, if they migrated out as a smolder, if they migrated out as a yearling, uh, they may have spent, you know, anywhere from uh, one to three years uh, out in the ocean before they return. Okay, and then we have another question for you, Towns, from Will Halligan from Ludorf and Scalmanini. Um, how are expectations of salmon restoration being managed given the temperature issues here in the San Joaquin River system with Millerton is success being judged by comparison to the San Joaquin River system, which has benefited from Shasta's cold water pool? Uh, that's also a similar question that came down here from, I think, uh, Tom Nysar that has San Joaquin Valley has always been hot. What strategies did pre-Columbian Chinook use to manage the high temperatures? I'll try to answer both of those uh, at the same time, at, at least uh, with the first question. What I would say is that um, we do look at other systems to uh, uh, I guess to make some comparisons, but we don't judge ourselves by those systems. So the restoration program has a suite of biological objectives that um, that we use uh, as a metric of success, uh, as a way to measure ourselves towards reaching that um, uh, self-sustaining, um, uh, naturally reproducing population. So those suite of biological objectives include things like um, uh, uh, an abundance estimate of returning adults that we have, and we're, we've got a goal that we're trying to reach by certain uh, uh, time steps um, as we make some of these uh, restoration um, efforts. And we have, things, like I said, like the population target, we have um, the effective population size. So these are the, you know, the number of fish that um, uh, uh, returned to the river, and then they were successful at spawning and, and producing progeny. And um, we just have a whole suite of objectives. And that's not just for the adults. We have those objectives um, for juvenile fish as well. And we have um, um, objectives that that uh, refer to like the survival that uh, emigrating smolts um, that we need to get uh, through the restoration area, uh, the you know survival of fish returning, pre-spawn survival. Um, we have a lot of these suite of objectives and that's how we are measuring uh, success in the program is reaching this goal. And those objectives are essentially based on um, what's been referred to as uh, uh, bringing back uh, a population in good condition, and that's been you know further defined about uh, what it uh, what it would take for a population to be self-sustaining and naturally reproducing. So with that being our goal, we have objectives to meet that goal. And that's how we, that's how we define uh, success, uh, restoration success for the program. Okay. I don't know if that answered both questions or not. Yeah. Um, the next one, I'm going to jump down to AJ Keith, and this could maybe may go to Gerald or Don or Aaron. 
uh, it's related to uh, given the known populations of predators such as bass and the large potential impacts out, out migrating survival how is this est restoration program monitoring effects of the predation this also relates into a side question i got from one of the other uh, attendees that was uh, interested in the introduction of the white sturgeon into the upper reaches through the uh, uh, fish passage projects so i'm not sure who wants to tackle that one Gerald, do you want to talk a little bit of that first as DFW was involved in some predation work, but I can I can certainly start. Well, I think the I think the thing that's important to keep in mind when we're talking about you know warm water predators, they're they're you know, those are abundant in our entire Central Valley system on some level because of how the systems have changed. We've got reduced flows and increased water temperatures that's made habitat more suitable for them. But there's really a lot of good information and data that shows when we can increase flow capacity and increase, you know, improve conditions such that they're um, better for Chinook salmon, you see a corresponding reduction in the number of predators. And so I think it's it's it makes sense that as the program moves forward and, and we have more success with the channel and flow improvements, I think it's pretty likely that we're going to see fewer predators. So the majority of the species that uh, that are in the river today are non-native uh, and, and many times piscivorous fishes, uh, meaning those fish that eat other fishes. The uh, Predominantly the, the black bass species, the largemouth bass, uh, black bass, and then as you move downstream uh, towards the confluence of the Merced, you see a lot of uh, striped bass and striped bass coming up from the Delta. Uh, all these bass species and uh, other sunfish type species are largely, uh, are large predators. Um, uh, some of the biologists here actually documented for the first time that green sunfish uh, predated on salmon par uh, up in, in uh, reach one. So, uh, you know, we're learning new things about predators. Uh, you know, in my history, over 10 year history with the program now, uh, you know, the, the Department of Fish and Wildlife and, and Reclamation, we've done a number of predator uh, pilot studies and studies on like mine pits and the contribution of mine pit predators to the system. We certainly, if you look at the rotary screw trap data, uh, thousands upon thousands of uh, small sunfish and bass species make it out of these mine pits annually and enter into either rotor screw traps or once upon a time we used to have weirs out in the river and we would capture 20, 30,000, you know, non-native uh, predator type species. Uh, so yes, uh, you know, we, we're, we're looking at the, the influence of, of mine pits on the restoration program and the state has been working diligently on uh, you know partitioning off some of these mine pits so th that they're uh, less impactful to the program, and then uh, you know some of the work's being done right now is mainly monitoring. Just let, let's figure out if we actually have an issue with predators, um, you know, in the lower sections, and and when they do they perform the um, uh, the adult return monitoring and the spring uh, or the and and the steelhead monitoring. They're actually looking at the number of predators, in some cases tagging those predators to look at recaps, recaptures to, to determine like what is the pred uh, predator size, you know, what is the population size so we can start determining impacts to those. Another factor, the thing that we're looking at is when we're designing these new structures, designing uh, fish passage and fish screening structures, we design these structures in a way, learning from other systems that we can reduce the potential uh, predation at these sites. And so we look to reduce um, areas where lion weight predators can sit uh, out of, you know, they're out of the, like in a, uh, a flow refuge. And so that they would, you know, these predators would dart out into the water column and grab a, a, uh, a juvenile Chinook salmon is going, uh, moving downstream. We look at that, we look at these predator refuges, we try to eliminate those in, our, in the design of our structure. So, so the, the, you know, the real question here or the real answer is, is that currently we're doing, you know, monitoring to determine if there is a problem. We're working, the state is, uh, you know, looking at uh, issues uh, with mine pits and then making sure three, we're designing structures that are um, uh, work well to reduce predation in, uh, you know, for salmon. 
Okay, uh, we just hit our time for uh, at the uh, 1050 break. We're a little bit past that, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up right here. I want to very much thank all the panelists for their presentations and responding to the questions. A reminder, everyone, that we will be responding to all questions that come into the um, uh, questions tab later. So continue to put those in, and we will forward those onto the speakers. Uh, we will be taking a break until 11 a.m. In the meantime, we have a um, short video that's been compiled that included some of Towns' video and other activities and on the restoration pr um, program. So Kirsten will show that now, and we'll be uh, reconvening at uh, 11. Thank you.